Pro-social behavior is just a fancy way of saying helping behavior. So we're going to be talking about acts of helping others. Earlier in the textbook, back in chapter 4, which you would have covered back in 104, there are evolutionary approaches to uh, pro-social behavior. So they would have talked about altruism and two different evolutionary theories that would talk about how altruism might have evolved. Um, looking at kin selection, where we are most likely to help others that we share more genes with. So you're a lot more likely to help a sibling or a child than you are to help, say, your fourth or fifth cousin, or someone who's not related at all. So that helps explain why behavior like altruism, where you put yourself at risk with no real benefit to yourself, is the kind of behavior that might evolve. Because usually, behaviors that put you at risk are uh, evolved against. They wouldn't become more common in the population because if you put yourself more at risk, you're more likely to die. So kin selection was one of the ways that uh, evolutionary theorists have proposed to try and explain away the problem of altruism. Another way of looking at it is using the theory of reciprocal altruism, basically saying that you help someone so that they help you in return at some point in the future. And for this one, you see evidence with humans and other species where if you give assistance to someone, they're a lot more likely to help you out in the future. It kind of relates back to stuff we talked about earlier in the chapter where you can get your foot in the door by helping someone early on and they'll reciprocate in the future. So these are two ways of explaining evolutionarily speaking how altruistic behavior or helping behavior that can put yourself at risk um, or reduce your survival might have evolved despite the surface uh, interpretation where behavior that puts you at risk shouldn't be selected for. But of course, because it's already been covered earlier in the book and by a different course, we're going to focus more on the social side of things, on the psychology side of things, and less on the evolution. It's just important to know that it exists. So if we, stop, if we talk about social learning and cultural influences, we can talk about the norm of reciprocity. And this is kind of related to this reciprocal altruism, but it's basically focusing on the social thought side of things where you're a lot more, where you are a lot more likely to help others who have helped you. So you are going to reciprocate because you've seen someone who's willing to help you, so you're more likely to help them. Now this isn't specific to just things like altruism, this is also things like if somebody treats you nicely, you should treat them nicely in return. So if someone helps you, you help them. If someone is kind, you should be kind back. So that's the norm of reciprocity, where it's a social norm that you should respond in like fashion. We also have a norm of social responsibility. And this is sort of a bigger than just yourself idea, where you should help others and try and contribute to society's welfare. So society expects that you should overall try and be helpful and contribute to society as a whole. Now with most norms, as we've already discussed, you're going to have um, support and reinforced good feelings where people will be happy when you follow these norms, and if you don't follow these norms, it's going against social norms. It's something that would be punished or disapproved of. So it feels weird to be rude to someone who's being kind to you. Um, and people will look down on you if you won't do something to help your community. If you see someone littering and you, uh, and that's directly going against that community's well-being, then you're going to think poorly of that person. So they're going against the norm of taking responsibility for their environment. Now these norms have to develop from somewhere. So as you grow up and you see other people acting in these ways, you start adopting those norms yourself. And we can see these norms evolving through socialization. So children will act more pro-socially if they're taught empathy. 
So if children learn to put themselves in others' shoes or to think about what it must feel like to be that person, they're a lot more likely to help because they can empathize with those who are in that situation. And as you might imagine, there are quite a few cultural influences on helping behavior. So a study that was done on people in India, specifically people who were Hindu, they feel that it's a moral obligation to help people around them regardless of the size of their need. So they would be just as likely to help someone find a lost pencil as they would be to help someone try and raise money to keep their house. So whether it's a large or a small problem that they're being faced with, you are morally obligated to help those people. Whereas a study conducted in America showed that for situations where the assistance required is mild, where there isn't a big need for help, that individuals should feel less obligated and then it's your choice if you offer to help, but you don't have to feel like you need to. So cultural differences tell us what the norm is for responding to helping those that you interact with. Now I've kind of already given us some groundwork to talk about the next section, which is getting into empathy and altruism. And so like I said, altruism is that idea of doing something selflessly, doing something that isn't going to directly benefit you, but ends up being a good thing for others. Now when we talked about it in terms of evolutionary theories, we're talking about altruism as in putting yourself at physical risk, but Altruism could also just be something like, I give money to someone and expect nothing in return. Now, there's lots of debate as to what's motivating this kind of behavior. There's a lot of people who believe that altruism isn't a real thing, that people are somehow getting some benefit from all acts, and no one is truly altruistic. But that's a pretty big can of worms to open up, because that is a very strong, ongoing debate. Um, but we're going to talk about one theory that's the uh, empathy altruism hypothesis. And so like we've already said, empathy is that ability to share another's experience, that ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes. And this hypothesis states that we exhibit altruism because we can empathize with those who are in need. So we can put ourselves in the shoes of someone who's struggling and we decide to help them because we can feel what they would be feeling. We can um, sort of put ourselves in their shoes and understand what it is that they need and what it must be to be them. So our altruism stems from being able to relate to the people that we're helping. Again, there have been tons and tons of studies done looking into this hypothesis. And so the theory for the main one that's talked about in the textbook is that it's easier to empathize with someone who is more similar to you. So you could set up a situation where um, you can pair people with individuals who they are more or less similar to, someone it is easier or harder for them to empathize with, and see how much altruism they show based on that degree of relatedness, that degree of ability to empathize with them. The specific experiment from the textbook set up a participant and a confederate who were paired together and they had differing degrees of relatedness and through a rigged coin flip, the confederate would be assigned to be the one of the pair who would be receiving electrical shocks as part of this particular task. And the person who was supposed to be receiving these electrical shocks would express fear and discomfort and not wanting to do that. And the test was to see whether the participant would volunteer to take the confederate's place. And the more that they were similar to each other, the more that the participant could empathize with the confederate, the more likely they were to offer to take their place, the more likely they were to exhibit that altruistic behavior. We can also see these increases in altruistic behavior for things like charitable donations or um, just relating to others and choosing to help. But there's another angle to consider here. And that's, maybe it isn't that feeling of empathy and the desire to help, but maybe it's the fact that they would have felt guilty if they hadn't helped. 
Or maybe it's like the negative state relief model says, and this high feeling of empathy actually leads people to feel distress when they're fe seeing others suffer. So it's not that they can put themselves in the other's shoes and they want to help. It's maybe that seeing other people suffering causes them distress, and by acting in a theoretically altruistic fashion, by helping or exhibiting that helping behavior, they're really just reducing their own personal feelings of distress. That act of helping is really just motivated by trying to reduce their own feeling of awfulness 